Welcome to the Transportation Asset Management Webinar Series Part 1, Highlights from Transit State of Good Repair Track. This webinar will begin with Kyle Nicholson, FTA Program Analyst, who will provide an overview of the Transit State of Good Repair Program from the 9th National Conference on Transportation Asset Management, upon which this webinar is based. Then Rob Paget, Rick Laver, Dr. David Rose, Lauren Isaac, and Bob Peskin will summarize specific sessions from the conference. And now, I will turn the call over to Kyle. Okay, thank you very much, Judy, and I want to thank everyone at TRB and at NTI for all their efforts in putting the webinar together. This afternoon's webinar is a collaborative effort between TRB, NTI, and FTA. It, the goal of the webinar is twofold, to continue the momentum from the Transit Asset Management Conference and to offer a summary of the conference for those who are unable to attend. The webinar also offers the FTA the opportunity to communicate with the transit industry, continue to offer technical assistance, recognizing that enhancing transit asset management techniques and practices is can assist agencies in achieving and maintaining their systems in a state of good repair. Uh, a quick review of the conference, it was the first, the track was designed on, on based on a state of good repair with five, uh, within five sessions within the track and 21 presenters. This was the first time that a track was solely dedicated to transit. And the presenters during the webinar were also the moderators of the session at the uh, Transit Asset Management Conference. I'd like to thank them for their continued support. We have their unique and valuable insights on transit asset management and safe good repair. Thank you, Kyle. The first speaker today will be Rob Padgett. Mr. Padgett has more than 15 years of public and private sector experience in transportation planning and policy with expertise in the area of public transportation planning and policy. He joined High Street Consulting Group in 2010, where he is supporting a variety of clients, including the Federal Transit Administration. Prior to joining High Street, Mr. Paget served as the Director of Policy Development and Research for the American Public Transportation Association. He holds a Master of Regional Planning and a Bachelor of Arts in Political Science from the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. Mr. Paget is currently the Chair of TRB's Joint Subcommittee on Transit State of Good Repair and a member of the TRB Transit Management of Performance Committee. Um, and I'm, I'm going to start um, and talk about um, the session on balancing system expansion and system renewal. And this is a, a topic that we don't hear much about, but obviously is a big issue in a number of systems across the country. We were fortunate to have a diverse set of participants in the session that represented a range of different agencies across the country. Uh, first, Jeremy Schaaf with Inspect Tech, who is uh, supporting UTA on their transit asset management program. Michael Hirsch, the Deputy Director of Maintenance at Santa Clara Valley Transportation Authority. Sharon Cooney, the Chief Operating Officer at San Diego Metropolitan Transit System. And finally, Patricia Hendren, the Director of the Office of Performance at WMATA. And one of the, um, one of the things that we observed as, as we uh, talk to agencies that are, that are getting into this conversation is that it's common to see um, the issue, uh, particularly in growing metropolitan areas in places where there's a maturing existing transit system that's in need of rehabilitation or replacement, but also continued pressure to expand service and, and doing so in an environment of fiscal constraint. But in a lot of these places, we're, we're continuing to see strong support for public transportation. And some of the common steps that you'll hear about in presentations is, um, is to really understand the current system first. Before you can have a conversation about um, how you balance the demand for your existing assets and your existing system versus expansion of the system. You first need to understand um, your inventory and analysis of existing assets, uh, determine an approach that you're going to use to assess the asset conditions, and then based on that, develop tools to evaluate and prioritize long-term capital needs. And finally, establish some sort of uh, a desired system condition that, that you can use to balance the uh, competing demands under funding constraints. So we, we first heard uh, from UTA, um, and UTA is one of the um, agencies that is a recipient of FTA grants to support a, the development of a transit asset management program. 
and they are building a new system primarily for the rail and facility assets um, to support critical decisions in the agency, uh, provide an overview of the asset inventory and condition, uh, quickly flag critical safety items, and also provide a risk-based um, assessment and um, information on the best time to rehabilitate and, re and replace assets, but importantly to provide a management tool for budgets inside the agency. Some of the, the key steps at UTA, um, and you're going to hear this first one again and again through, throughout the presentation, is develop an inventory condition of all assets in the agency and to think about some sort of a quantification um, via some sort of a rating scale that will allow the agency to compare conditions both within an asset class and across assets. Um, UTA is also collecting information, including a subjective assessment using narrative text, but also information um, including pictures and videos and sketches and drawings. And some of the technology that's out there now is allowing agencies to go far beyond what they've done historically. And one of the interesting things that we heard about with UTA is they're also incorporating a, a risk analysis into their prioritization and thinking about uh, key parts of the system that they need to keep in a, in a state of good repair. Our next uh, presenter from Santa Clara Valley Transportation Authority talked about um, their own efforts that, that relate very specifically to this conversation and, and new capacity versus the existing system. Um, they heard from FTA that, they, that there was a desire for Santa Clara Valley to show that it understood its own uh, state of good repair. And they did this. Um, they did this effort to be able to satisfy FTA's desire to get funding for the BART extension. So, in the case of Santa Clara Valley, they adopted the MBTA's asset management approach. And as many of you know, MBTA was one of the first places to really uh, push the envelope for this issue. Uh, Santa Clara Valley developed an extensive asset inventory. They've developed a predictive tool that helps them estimate the effect of investment levels on condition. And they've been able to, to use this tool to generate credible estimates of long-term capital needs. And importantly, they were able to address FTA's concerns and show that they understood the long-term capital needs in the agency, and the, the funding for the BART extension was approved. So next, next we heard from WMATA, and I, and I know many of you have heard um, about the recent uh, activities at WMATA to expand the system, and, and many people think of this as a relatively new system. But in the map on the left, you'll see that actually a lot of the system is beginning to face uh, the need for rehabilitation and replacement. Some of the system is almost 40 years old today. So, so we are here, again, in the a, in a metropolitan area that's experiencing a growth and demand for expansion, but still facing the need to rehabilitate and replace the existing system. The agency is uh, shifting its culture to a maintenance that will last and focusing on some of the key reliability challenges that it is currently facing. And, and just a couple that were talked about by our presenter include an emphasis on real car investments, a real targeted effort on the escalator program, and finally an expansion of train maintenance work hours. And one of the, the things that they've done at, at WMATA is they've really changed their approach to track, track maintenance to expand that into the hours outside of the, the peak service, essentially. And previously, they only conducted track maintenance uh, when the system was closed. They're also targeting some organizational changes to better manage assets and really making sure that um, customers are aware of a lot of these changes that are, that are underway. Um, in the case of San Diego, um, they define the problem as, as how do you address the, exist, the transportation needs of a rapidly expanding metropolitan area while maintaining existing service and infrastructure. And this is really the core issue around this conversation. They're facing rapidly growing ridership in San Diego. They're still moving forward with system extensions and at the same time um, working on managing the aging assets in the existing system. So this is just a, a long list of lots of expansions that are, are being considered by MTS. But at the same time, they have this existing system in place and have an aggressive program underway to expand and improve the, the existing system. So in the case of, of San Diego, again, uh, there was a comprehensive assessment of assets. And importantly, they're looking at all the needs together, not just the existing system, but also the needs for expansion, and communicating these needs broadly to um, their stakeholders. 
And, and an important tip that we heard from San Diego is they're building limits into their operating budget. So thinking beyond the current year and making sure that they uh, maintain some funding for the rehabilitation and replacement of capital assets and not just dealing with the immediate budget crisis. Also identifying maintenance funding for extensions and thinking about that as they expand the system and plan and implement steps to ensure that when they are conducting rehabilitation projects, that they do so in a way that doesn't create any negative public relations for the agency. So overall, we, we have a couple pages of tips here that we heard from our presenters. Um, a, a comprehensive asset inventory and asset condition is, is critical to the effort. Um, it's important to identify both your long-term operations needs and your maintenance funding for new services, so, so to think about both of those. Um, and as I mentioned with San Diego, um, another tip is to build limits into your operating budget to maintain funding for maintenance, rehabilitation, and replacement, and establish some sort of separation between your investment decisions and those who are affected by those decisions. So as you're um, working on your projects and prioritizing your capital investments, establish that separation so that those are most directly affected or not those who are making the decisions about priorities. Um, it's important to communicate the benefits of this maintenance work to the success of the organization. And, and when you're thinking about rehabilitation of infrastructure, mix in tangible upgrades. So, so one of the challenges with state of, state of good repair projects is that there's not necessarily a ribbon to cut where you're opening a new station or extending the line, but there are ways to improve the system when you're making these, these rehabilitation investments. To so think about asset management not as a software tool, but as a process. And then finally, um, and this is a direct quote from Santa Clara Valley that perhaps is a good theme for today, is a head in the sand approach will lead to monster backlog, loss of customers, and loss of revenue. Um, next steps um, is to continue development of effective tools and approaches to inventory and um, ass assessment of condition of assets. And we heard this theme throughout the presentation, even though we're talking about both expansion and rehabilitation of existing assets, you really need to know what you have on the ground today and the condition of assets. Um, it's important to focus also on the organizational approach, approach and processes, and we heard that um, throughout the presentations. And finally, um, consider development of some sort of a benchmarking group that will let agencies learn from each other. Our next speaker will be Rick Laver. Mr. Laver is Director of Transit Asset Management with CH2M Hill. He has more than 20 years of transit industry experience focusing on asset management, state of good repair assessment, capital and O&M cost modeling, and financial analysis. Mr. Laver has developed and applied SGR decision support tools for a broad variety of U.S. transportation agencies, including U.S. DOT, Chicago RTA, San Francisco MTC, Illinois DOT, and many local transit operators. Mr. Laver has also led asset condition assessment and asset inventory development assignments conducted to support long-term SGR needs assessments. Okay, um, our session, uh, session 15, had uh, five presenters, so it, you'll forgive me if I take a little bit longer to get to our uh, <clears throat> the list of presenters in our session. And my approach is going to be to take sort of a Reader's Digest version of each of the, present, the presentations that were delivered in our session. So uh, first off was um, the title of the study, or the uh, presentation was a case study of regional applications of asset management. This is for Chicago RTA. And I'm putting this in the broader bucket of sort of regional asset management, and that will become the reasons for that will become clear in a second. Our presenter was Grace Gallucci, who is Senior Deputy Executive Director of Finance and Performance Management at uh, Chicago RTA. So the organization, RTA is a regional funding oversight body um, for all the transit operators in metropolitan Chicago. So if you're familiar with Chicago, you know the transit, uh, Chicago Transit Authority, CTA. CTA, large heavy rail operator, lots of buses, lots of rail, and lots of old uh, rail assets. Uh, Metro commuter rail, also a pretty large commuter rail operator. 
Uh, and again, a fair amount of uh, old assets in particular with relation to uh, track structures. And then uh, also Pace Suburban Bus, the third operator in the region. Uh, over a 1,000 bus uh, fleet and serving a pretty large uh, service area. I believe it's as large as Rhode Island, if I remember correctly. So we have a very large transit market, uh, but supported by aging infrastructure. So you know, how critical is the, uh, uh, the condition of this uh, infrastructure? <clears throat> well, based on recent analysis, um, for the next 10 years, the, uh, the region faces $24.6 billion in capital reinvestment needs over the next 10 years, and that includes uh, addressing the existing backlog, uh, normal replacement needs, and capital maintenance. So if you take that and you know, divide by 10 and figure out what the annual average would have to be to address those needs over the next 10 years, that would be $2.5 billion a year. Well, RTA you know, doesn't have anywhere near that level of funding capacity, at least not currently. So they're faced with a critical issue of, you know, one, hopefully to get more funding, but the other, uh, the other issue, of course, is how do you prioritize um, the existing needs uh, given the funding capacity you do have. So to address these needs, uh, RTA has sort of developed three approaches. One is to develop a regional asset inventory. This was first developed in uh, 2010, or the first uh, version of the inventory was completed in 2010. Uh, RTA is currently completing its second update and, and will continue to do so into the future. There's also an annual condition assessment process that RTA has implemented as well as development of a capital decision prioritization tool, and I'll go into each of these. So the inventory and condition assessment process, again, RTA completed the first or most recent development of a region-wide asset inventory, and as again, you heard Rob say in the previous session, this is sort of key to uh, all asset management processes. You need the inventory, you need to know what you have and what condition it's in to figure out what it is you need to do. So RTA went about the process of working with the service force to put together a regional asset inventory and understand the age, condition of assets, um, uh, types of assets, their maintenance histories, and so on, uh, sample the conditions of some of the assets, Assets, uh, figure out where the holes were, and then come up with a comprehensive listing. And then based on that, put together what was in 2010 the first uh, tenure needs, unconstrained tenure needs assessment uh, to obtain a state of good repair uh, for the Chicago region. The uh, report's on the right. You can find it on the web if you're interested. Uh, but again, this is where this $24.6 billion uh, of tenure reinvestment needs comes from. RTA is in the process of updating that uh, report, and there should be another one available later in the year. So given the uh, uh, availability of good quality asset inventory information and understanding the uh, condition of the assets, uh, the next step in the process was to develop a capital decision prioritization tool, which RTA has done. Uh, it's currently it's ongoing refinement over time, but there is an operating tool right now that's available to RTA. And effectively, this tool takes you know, all the assets reported by the service boards so of the local agencies, determines what which assets aren't in a state of good repair, either require rehab or replacement, and then prioritizes those needs based on a number of factors. And in the case of RTA, it's as condition, reliability, safety, rider impacts, and O&M cost impacts, and then ranks each of the assets relative to those, uh, those uh, um, priorities and those criteria score, figures out which ones can be funded given limited funding capacity, and then turns those into projects. Now, this capability, this prioritization capability, RTA intends to share this and all of the other aspects of its process with the industry. Uh, but these capabilities in particular for prioritization have already been built, uh, built into uh, the currently available version of FTA's Transit Economic Requirements light model or term light model, which is downloadable from FTA's website. So well, RTA continues to plan to provide uh, the industry with all the background and knowledge in developing the, the tool and the processes for uh, Asset, for asset inventory information development and so on, the prioritization piece is already available to you through term light. And just to get a sense of what the prioritization scoring looks like coming out of that process, here we have you know, a sample output of the average, not individual, but average uh, prioritization scores for groups of assets, starting with, you can see train control and revenue vehicles tend to perform very well under this, you know, this draft application or preliminary application of the prioritization tool, whereas other asset types aren't performing quite as well uh, based on how they score, which might include uh, non-revenue vehicles, revenue collection, and so on. But again, this is, a, this is an average individual vehicles uh, or individual assets. Um, the performance of individual assets can be different than what's presented here. It just gives you a sense of how this process works. So the outcome is that uh, RTA is completing its second regional condition assessment, and it has funded uh, four additional years beyond, the, the, beyond 2012, and it tends to continue the process on into the future, and it continues to refine each of these processes, its inventory collection, um, data collection, and 
um, development of the inventory or the prioritization tool um, um, continues to refine that into the future. It's So the next uh, session, uh, the next uh, presenter here was um, Susan Cox, who was the manager of Sa system safety at Delcan Corporation. And Susan focused on what I thought was a pretty interesting um, uh, issue area here, and that's the issue of obsolescence and safety management as it relates to asset management. I think many of us, or maybe maybe all of us, are aware of the issue of obsolescence for uh, parts for for uh, vehicles, for example. That's been a long been an issue for for uh, transit operators. Transit operators uh, utilize assets with long lives, and components of those may not always be available throughout the full, or easily available or replaceable throughout the uh, life of the asset. Some of those components are going to become obsolete, and it becomes uh, an issue as to how how to, to keep these assets in service. What Susan points out is that this is becoming more and more of a over time as more advanced technology, such as microprocessors, processors get built into these into transit assets, and more and more assets have more and more of these, uh, uh, these types of advanced technologies built into them, so it becomes an issue of, well, you may need to maintain a bus or a, a rail vehicle in a service for 12 or 25 years. Some of the assets or components, which with a high technology component in them, may not be available throughout the full life of the asset. So how are you going to manage that process? So again, the, the challenge is that transit uh, systems, rail or bus, are a mix of many different types of assets with many components, and some of them highly technologically laden. And while it hasn't been an issue, a significant an issue, or as much of an issue in the past to uh, maintain these assets in, in service uh, from an obsolescence viewpoint, it has been somewhat of an issue. It's becoming more of an issue over time as more and more higher technologies get embedded into, the, into these uh, technologies. Why? Well, some of these technologies have very short time frames. I want to guess that many folks on, the, folks on the line have their second or third generation of smartphone and maybe their second iPad and so on. Some of these, uh, these uh, uh, technologies have fairly quick turnover. Then there's a high probability that maybe your vendor may fail. Maybe their technology might not make it in the marketplace. They may not be available. Maybe there's a change in communications protocols, a broad variety of issues of why the technologies you have adopted and you've selected may not be available for the full life of the asset that you've purchased. So some fundamental questions then are, how do you anticipate uh, or plan detect obsolescence within your uh, asset portfolio? And what alternatives and contingencies and plans do you have in place to manage that risk? And then what are the risks? Which uh, types of assets, which types of technologies are most susceptible to obsolescence risk, the, the risk that the asset component won't be available to you in the future. And then the other half of risk is, and then what's the consequence of not being able to make use of that technology? So you not only can't you get the technology, but what's the cost of the failure that may result because you can't keep that bus in service or you can't keep that, the train control system in operation. Uh, other issues include um, um, the bottom bullet point here is whether you should replace an asset or maintain it in service into the future. Maintaining an asset in service in the future that has a lot of technology may mean it may be cheaper in the short run to maintain it in service, but in the long run it may cost you more because you haven't been able to replace or uh, because of obsolescence you haven't been able to keep, you run into problems down the road, whereas replacing now you can maybe avoid those issues of obsolescence, but at the risk of maybe uh, acquiring some new technology uh, obsolescence problems. So the issue here is that uh, the authors pointing, are pointing out is to develop a plan, a management approach to help identify uh, what your risks are, categorize your risks with respect to safety and obsolescence, what assets are more susceptible to obsolescence risk, and what are the, the consequences of those risks, and then manage those risks. Monitor where your major and minor uh, repairs and incidents and failures related to asset technologies are, are concerned. And then uh, the, the last two bullet points on this slide um, focus on when, before you even procure the asset, where consider the, the issue of obsolescence and managing obsolescence. So procuring asset, it's not just about what's the capital cost, the operating cost, the maintenance cost, what, what resources, materials, staffing you're going to require to keep that asset in service, but what are the probabilities of that um, of obsolescence of the technologies embedded in that asset, and if you have multiple alternatives to invest in different technologies when you're purchasing a new asset, consider what those options are with respect to obsolescence risk, and then, and then make your decision, a more um, informed decision based on that risk.
So in con conclusion, obsolescence, it's a fact of life, but it can be managed along with other aspects of managing the full uh, life cycle of individual assets. Uh, transit agencies, consultants, suppliers, vendors working together can figure out to how best to proactively manage the risk, proactively uh, plan for obsolescence, and then manage it, uh, obsolescence as part of your procurement process even before you've acquired uh, a new asset. The next presenter in our, uh, our uh, session was Dave Springstead from, uh, from MARTA. And if you're up with what MARTA's been doing, MARTA's been doing, and Dave have been doing an incredible job of implementing uh, what I'll call comprehensive soup to nuts asset management at the, um, the local agency level. They've really done, uh, done a terrific job. And it's seemingly any new idea that comes along, uh, it's not too long before you, you may see parts of that idea uh, implemented within MARTA's program. So the, the, the vision uh, from uh, MARTA's perspective and Dave's perspective was to uh, implement in, in, in a, uh, a comprehensive asset management system, uh, depending on four key elements. Uh, one is data. As we've already heard from Rob's uh, discussion earlier, accurate data is just core and central to asset management. You can't get started unless you have a good asset inventory and related data on condition and so on. So that's key to understanding what you have and what your needs are. Uh, next to that is the flow of information. It's not just data. You want to create information out of that data uh, coming out of your enterprise asset management system, but then that information needs to flow into your decision-making process through your capital improvement plan. And that should be informed by your strategic priorities. So in the, in the third bubble here, it's not just that your CIP can't, can't reflect all of your needs. Because there is insufficient funding to do everything you need to do, your CIP needs to focus on what you think is most uh, highest priority, which best meets your, um, your strategic priorities. And that understanding comes out of use of a good deal of analysis and uh, decision support tools. And then finally, you get beyond the data and the decision making and the analysis, and you get to actually implementing projects, delivering projects, and managing assets throughout the life cycle. I won't go through this next slide in, in much in the way of detail, but uh, a couple of things to notice. One is that these are these processes that are depicted here are more than just processes on a page. Um, MARTA is doing a very good job of actually implementing these processes and turning them into you know, roles and responsibilities within the organization. And if you look at the process at the bottom, which kind of encapsulates uh, the, the entire process, the, the top box, the enterprise asset management system, you have a bit of an extract from it. In the upper left, you can see how they're you know, managing the data, collecting the data. Every time you touch the data or MARTA touches the data, they are updating the information in terms of the, the condition of the, the asset, what preventive maintenance is being performed on the asset, any other features or requirements that uh, the asset may require or as, or as it ages, as it changes, are being recorded and put into a database so that that information, key central input, can be used uh, for further uh, decision making and analysis down the road, including capital planning, decision tools, and so on. The next uh, slide, um, I think this is actually pretty key and I'm, uh, understand, for understanding the key component of asset management. Very often we see a lot of discussion of tools, data, uh, the decision making process, but we don't always see uh, an org chart. An org chart that shows roles and responsibilities with respect to asset management, who has who needs what data? What is it? What is your responsibility within the organization for sharing data, for for utilizing asset inventory information, for communicating it with others, for making decisions, um, and then the resources. In fact, to carry out asset management in the first place, it's pretty hard to maintain an asset inventory, to do the condition assessments, and do all the other pieces if you don't have the resources, the roles and responsibilities, and the clout in the organization. Uh, to, to do that, and the key takeaway here is, hey, they actually have a, um, an org chart. Uh, finally, though, I'll focus on, um, uh, for uh, Marta's presentation, you know, what, was, what were identified as four building blocks for the Transit Asset Management Program. As we've already mentioned, asset data, key component. You know, the act, maintaining the data, accurate data, comprehensive data, up-to-date data, uh, validated data. Next, uh, out, making use of that data for the decision-making process is to develop your capital plan, but it's just not a capital plan. It's a strategic plan that the artist is working towards where it, uh, what they actually invest in is 
fully aligned with the goals and objectives of the organization and the strategy uh, of the organization as a whole. Uh, that feeds into the decision uh, support tools, so uh, using tools to make the data actually meaningful, educating the decision-making process so you know, okay, we understand the condition of our assets, we understand what our needs are, we put that up against our priorities and our funding capacity, what are our potential futures? If we change priorities, what, what what are the futures we end up with in terms of what goes into the back, what comes out of the backlog, but also what stays in the backlog and how that impacts operating um, uh, performance, reliability, and so on. And then finally, taking all of that and turning it into actual physical projects and uh, ongoing asset management. I'm going to skip over these next two slides pretty quickly, but uh, within Dave's uh, presentation, uh, which again is, I think is available on TRD website in its full detail, you can get a sense of within each of these four pillars what the you know how um, MARTA went about populating the data. Um, so in this case, you know how did they capture the data? What are the processes for controlling the data, updating the data, scrubbing the data, validating the data? Um, what types of tools is, is MARTA working with? processes for, again, for criteria scoring, assessing funding capacity, what-if analysis, looking at what the potential futures are. So again, these are, these are critical, these four, these four building blocks um, in, in, in maintaining the whole, uh, in putting together the whole, MARTA's whole asset management process. So again, the five key takeaways I would take from, from MARTA's presentation are these, these four pillars, it's data, data, data. It's the investment planning that is tied to the data and also tied to strategic objectives. It's the decision tools to use the data to figure out what our potential futures are, what MARTA's potential futures are, and how to prioritize investments to get to the most desired future. And then also, what, how do you implement the actual projects uh, that you've selected and control those projects and manage the life cycle of assets? And finally, you've got to have organizational roles and responsibilities and hopefully resources. The next one was from uh, Nate Coley, who is currently with FHWA, but he um, made the presentation talking about his time at uh, Maryland DOT when the uh, Maryland DOT was implementing, I believe it was Maximo at the statewide level, but experience in implementing an asset management system at the statewide level across all modes of transportation, not just transit. So in the case of Maryland DOT, you can see all the transit modes well represented at the top, the boxes at the top, so number of assets and routes and stations, just give you a sense of the, 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 the size of the system. So this would be all of the transit uh, assets in, in uh, Baltimore, of course, and suburban Washington, but as well as all the, the smaller, uh, uh, small bu local um, uh, bus operators and so on. But this uh, implementation also crossed other modes as well, so you know, airports, motor vehicle association, ports, highways, and so on. The implementation took quite a while, as you can imagine, across a number of the, with that many organizations involved, starting in the mid-90s, and then implementation, uh, selection in the mid-90s, implementation in the late 90s, and then into the, 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 the early 2000s to get implement, implemented across each of these uh, uh, organizations within uh, Maryland DOT. And then finally, by 2003, they pretty much finished, uh, hooked everything to a central server farm, and hooked to the uh, financial management system to sort of track the financials of uh, the asset management process. Key uh, lessons learned that Nate pulled from his experience were the, you know, the value of inventorying and tagging all non-disposable assets, and I would actually refer to this as uh, at component level, so it's below the asset level at the component level, such as transmissions and engines. But uh, a really key takeaway, I think, is uh, the need to keep um, employees involved at every step in the process of implementing a new system, whether it's a maintenance management system or any type of EAN system or a decision support tool, whatever it is, that everybody in the organization is, keeps playing and understanding the tool throughout the development process, so once the consultant and the vendor and the developer leave the scene, that you know what it is that you're left with. So it's pretty critical that everybody stay involved and that you have a good understanding of what you need. And Nate's also suggesting, or Nat's also su suggesting, you don't need the limo, you don't need the Lexus version, you need what you need and what's right for your organization's uh, processes. Uh, then the final presentation was given by Hugh Lodge, who's a principal at uh, Cambridge Systematics. And this is sort of state level asset management. It's a little like the RTA regional asset management process, but bring it brought up to the state level. So Virginia DRPT and then PennDOT both are 
uh, have a number of state level or uh, grantees, small, medium, large bus operators, and some rail operators who come to them with funding requirements. Their need uh, objective here was to develop, to develop a web-based tool to assess what the long-term needs are of these grantees, and then better allocate capital funding across the grantees. So uh, I think I covered this one all right. So again, Virginia DOT, PennDOT, and the process of uh, allocating funds across grantees. You have an existing uh, system called PROGRESS, Program Guidance and Grant Evaluation System, and now they're moving towards something called TRANSAM, which is Transit Asset Management. It is not a 70s muscle, muscle car. So the approach then was to <clears throat> develop a quick, equitable, and systematic method of assessing uh, the grant applications of um, the grantees and how to uh, allocate the grant funds. And they do this uh, evaluation process over a 20-year planning horizon. And as part of that process, as we've similar to other things we've already discussed, is they have a scoring process to score the different needs and the grant applications based on the condition of assets, public benefits, and other, other criteria. Uh, the platform, as I said, it's a web-based tool. It can be <coughs> installed uh, by an agency, you know, internally or locally, or run in the cloud, as it were. And then it's also based on free open source code and databases. And, and a, a key benefit, I think, of the system is that it can be operated off of existing databases. So given the platform, the structure, the architecture, uh, a lot of these organizations, grantees, the state, and so on, they didn't have to recreate the wheel in terms of their their databases, they could hook into it using this, uh, this architecture. Just to give you a quick sense of what <clears throat> uh, type of output comes from the, this progress tool, here's a screenshot uh, of the progress tool as, as uh, utilized by DR Virginia DRPT. And it's showing uh, a backlog of needs and future capital reinvestment needs for all the grantees and across the state, all different types of assets. And you can see the backlog by asset type and as well as future needs by asset type. And again, this is information that is, provides critical understanding of you know, what the needs are within the state and then how a DRPT can best allocate uh, limited grant funding to, to address those needs. The core functions, the, uh, the tool stores, maintains, can edit the data, write reports off of you know, what data is out in the, or what assets are currently in service. It predicts the future reinvestment needs of those uh, assets based on deterioration and age models and then projects um, the future funding requirements based on that analysis. Next steps, Cambridge Systematics working with uh, the two state DOTs are just looking to for further refinements of, these, of the tools and, and better plugging them into the existing processes of each of these uh, state DOTs. Our next speaker is Lauren Isaac. Ms. Isaac leads Parson Brinkerhoff's Transit Effectiveness and Management Service Area. In this capacity, she assists transit agencies across the U.S. to improve their asset management, capital planning, and decision-making processes. A graduate of American Public Transportation Association's leadership program, Ms. Isaac has experience managing research and analysis assignments for a diverse range of transit providers. Whether it is assisting agencies with sweeping operational changes or developing project prioritization tools and evaluation metrics for decision making, she has helped agencies to evaluate their capital planning and programming efforts as it relates to their own goals and industry standards. David Rose and I actually led this panel um, where we heard about using performance measures to identify and address maintenance requirements. And I think you'll you'll hear the, the impetus for each of the agencies to do an asset management initiative is really what ended up driving the performance measures that are used. So you'll see it varies pretty pretty um, significantly between these agencies. So you'll see that we had four different agencies represented: Steve Barang from New York MTA, Rolando Cruz from Long Beach Transit, Wilhelm Eberson from Amtrak, and then Jeff Knippel and Laura Zale from SEPTA. So I'll start out by talking about New York MTA. So Steve explained that back in 1982, the system was actually on the brink of collapse. Um, the ridership fell by about 40%. There was a significant amount of crime and graffiti, um, really poor image generally for the agency. And they were dealing with frequent breakdowns and derailments. So that led to the New York State Legislature uh, actually requiring that MTA um, create a five-year investment plan. So as a result of that, 
the agency developed an asset inventory and started doing condition assessments on all of their assets. So their inventory tracks assets based on their location, their age, their cost, and condition. And for the condition, they actually uh, have a consistent scoring metric across all of the assets where they score everything with a score of one to four. So they're able to compare and prioritize across all of their assets. And based of all, on all of that information, they prioritize all of the assets based on their cyclical needs and based on what will maximize the customer benefits into a five-year and a 20-year capital program. During this presentation, Steve actually showed uh, metrics comparing what the performance of the system was back in, 19, in the 1980s and compared that with where they're at now. And it, they had drastic increases in uh, by mode ridership, on-time performance, mean distance between failure, and also felonies. The next one I'll talk about is Long Beach Transit. Uh, Long Beach, for those of you who don't know, um, is in Southern California. They serve about 89,000 passengers a day, and the service area is about 98 square miles. Um, they, their asset management focus uh, is on not only their buses, but also their operating facilities, their administrative facility, and uh, the about 3,000 stops that they have. So Rolando explains that there are many asset management initi initiatives going on. They are currently upgrading their Ventix Ellipse software. They're updating their stop inventory. They already had a vehicle inventory. And now they're actually also updating their facility inventory and incorporating the findings from the inventory updates into their maintenance and capital plan. Uh, they are also doing a full criticality assessment of their assets. But behind all of this is a focus on performance management. And I love the quote, if you measure it, it will get done. So Rolando is leading this management-led initiative where they are looking to integrate performance management into all of the business processes. He talked about when it comes to creating KPIs or key performance indicators, how important it is to have a clear purpose in mind of what you're trying to accomplish, that you are aiming toward organizational goals. Um, and that really comes with an understanding of what the agency's issues are. It's very important that the KPIs are uh, collected uh, systematically and as part of a normal collection process. Um, these KPIs should be in alignment with the team's goals so that all of your staff and management feel ownership over not just the collection of the KPIs, but also seeing improvement of them. And finally, he made the point that it's really important that KPIs are easy to collect, review, and understand. So he gave a lot of examples of KPIs that are used. And, and I'll give you a few examples. On the facility side, they are tracking maintenance costs over replacement value. Uh, for equipment, they're looking at the condition rating. And they've established a policy of maintaining a score of 2.5 or higher for all critical equipment. They, for maintenance performance, they want to, uh, they're tracking the backlog of maintenance. And they're also looking at the ratio of planned versus reactive maintenance uh, with a policy goal of uh, exceeding 70% of the proactive maintenance. They're looking at customer satisfaction. And then one thing that's really exciting is how they've incorporated sustainability goals into this. And so they're looking at electricity usage, water usage, recycling. And for all of these, they have policies and targets around them. The next agency is Amtrak. Wilhelm spoke about the asset management initiative that he led while uh, as a consultant there. Um, it's interesting how this came about. Amtrak actually started this because they needed a defensible way of billing all of the maintenance requirements associated with their track because there are so many different stakeholders that rely on and use that track. They undertook a really huge effort to develop an asset inventory where all the assets had a clear you know, location and an established hierarchy that was meaningful for the people actually managing the assets. Uh, they integrated all of their systems related to maintenance management, work order management, and others so that they had the information at their fingertips and consistently available. They used all this information 
for managing the service, making sure that they had the, the assets available and performing as needed. Um, and all of this kind of came together into their asset management system and ERP system. So I thought what was interesting for Amtrak is uh, they have a definition of state of good repair that is a condition in which, the, in which the existing physical assets, both individually and as a system, are A, functioning as designed and within their useful lives, and B, are sustained through regular maintenance and replacement programs. And they've really designed all of their systems around this. And one thing that Wilhelm pointed out is that this requires a full state of good repair assessment. It requires an understanding of the agency's future capacity requirements, so what are the growth requirements. And finally, it, understand, it requires an understanding of your future per performance requirements, and that includes both operational and financial. The last agency to highlight here is SEPTA. Um, SEPTA, uh, just for those of you that don't know, provides heavy rail, commuter rail, light rail, and bus service in the Philadelphia area. Um, they have a lot of really old assets. That was one of the first things that was pointed out to us. Uh, SEPTA was created by the state, but when SEPTA actually assumed operations of the system, there were already a significant amount of assets that were in a state of good, uh, disrepair. So um, they developed a prioritization approach, which is, as it says on the slide, fix it first and maintain the asset. So that's kind of their overarching policy and prioritization approach. And as part of that, they have an asset man management initiative going on right now. This is uh, partially funded by an FTA state, state of Good Repair grant, where they are developing a State of Good Repair database to establish the good repair backlog. And they're then going to use that to prioritize their capital program. They have spent a lot of time working with all of the departments in the agency to develop uh, a meaningful hierarchy for all of their assets, and then also figure out what information they want to track for each of the assets. And that includes the age, the remaining useful life, the renewal activities and associated costs, and the ridership associated with them. And so they are currently working on developing a system where they'll be able to do scenario evaluation and show how different funding levels will have a different um, impact on their state of good repair. They, they really made a focus of saying that they don't, one of the uh, ways of stretching their limited capital dollars is to have a, not have an all or nothing mentality for stations so they can invest in components of the station so that it's best serving their customers while not being as expensive as replacing the entire station. And they did highlight the fact that um, there are some lessons learned when it comes to developing an inventory. It is a very iterative and time-consuming task, and the biggest reason for that is that they've been getting input from the departments throughout the agency, and they did recognize the importance of getting that buy-in from all of them. Some general observations, and I think you'll hear some themes between all of the presentations at the TRB track. Um, was that it's really important to have leadership and vision when it comes to an asset management initiative because uh, this is obviously something that impacts the entire agency. It can have short-term positive impacts, but it also has um, a long-term approach, and it requires um, real dedication of staff and money and championing. It's important to note that when you have successes early on, that does help to build momentum. and. And I think a lot of the agencies were able to share um, things that they've done in the short term that have helped the, the rest of the agency better understand asset management and give them something to grab onto. Data-driven decision making, which I think everybody, all of the previous presenters have made this point too, is just very powerful. It can be, you know, can be difficult to compile a data, but when you have it and you have a process to maintain it, it's very powerful. Organizations do learn and adapt, especially when they can understand the benefits. And finally, a culture of continual improvement is very important because I think, um, you know, even someone like David Springstead, where they've done a ton of work at MARTA, I think they would all say that um, building in that culture where you're never really done with an asset management initiative is what helps lead to the successes. So implications for next steps. I, I took a different approach on this. I think all of us recognize the importance of having the industry focusing on asset management. And the exciting thing is that there are a lot of great things going on. 
Um, the FTA has commissioned Parsons Brinkerhoff, my company, to develop an, a transit-specific asset management manual. The FTA has also led um, a few years of state of good repair roundtables where the industry has been sharing best practices and really working towards standards and sharing knowledge. APTA has an asset management standards committee, and the kind of uh, approach that that group is taking is still being figured out. That there are a lot of there's a lot of positive momentum there, and just in general, the conferences, as you can see from this conferences, the conferences and the papers are all being shared that um, related to asset management, and that's that's been helping to educate and inform people. Our last speaker will be Bob Peskin. Mr. Peskin is Senior Consulting Manager at AECOM. He consults in the areas of transportation financing, planning, and management. He has been with AECOM throughout his entire 35-year career, serving the transit industry and a host of government agencies at the local, state, and federal level. He pioneered analytical methodologies in the areas of transportation financial planning, analysis of transportation infrastructure capital needs, and operating and maintenance cost modeling. His work focuses on the application of quantitative information to support transportation decision making. He works with public agency staff in integrating financial, capital, and operating data from all functional areas, including planning, engineering, transportation, and maintenance. Dr. Peskin supports transportation agency executive staff and governing boards as they commit limited public resources to major capital investments and make difficult budgeting decisions. He is currently examining infrastructure renewal and replacement needs at transit systems in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, Dallas, Texas, and Vancouver, British Columbia, and recently completed similar analysis in San Francisco, California, and San Jose, California, Dr. Peskin is chair of the TRB Subcommittee on Transit Capital Replacement. Uh, today, uh, I'd like to talk about um, a, an interesting topic that, that um, we haven't heard a lot of discussion about so far, which is how to make the, the compelling argument for um, additional funding or preserving existing funding um, to address infrastructure renewal. We were very fortunate during this session to have uh, three excellent speakers uh, to address this topic. Uh, Yanel Grant, who talked about uh, some efforts underway in California to prepare the legislature uh, and local governments for what the coming needs uh, will be over the next 10 years to address uh, transit infrastructure renewal and replacement along with um, the capacity expansion. Bill Robert then broadened the discussion to talk about what um, the industry-wide uh, experience has been in developing tools, uh, again, to make the compelling argument for the need for additional funding to address these needs. And then uh, back in California, uh, Glenn Tepke talked about the specific efforts uh, on the part of the Metropolitan Transportation Commission um, using one of the tools, actually one of the tools that's already been uh, addressed a little bit uh, today. So we'll start with, um, with the presentation from Yanel Grant. Uh, the context uh, for this work was to address both the needs to uh, renew the infrastructure um, that supports existing services, the so-called uh, maintain scenario, and addressed uh, what the funding needs would be for further improvement of the existing system and expansion of the system to address increased um, service levels and service in, into new markets. Uh, both aspects of these needs are really uh, very important in uh, addressing what uh, the funding needs are going to be. Uh, this was a sort of a medium-term uh, look into the future, um, uh, looking out 10 years, uh, so well within the, uh, the longer-term forecast period, uh, say that uh, transit agency or MPO long-range plans uh, are addressing. Uh, an important aspect of uh, the work that Yanel did focused on um, off-the-shelf uh, data sources, 
quite often in doing this type of work, it's very important, if only to get the work done, but more importantly, to get the buy-in um, and, part and, and uh, you know, wholehearted participation of the various stakeholders to rely as much as possible on um, uh, um, off-the-shelf information. And we list uh, in the second bullet here a lot of these off-the-shelf sources. Funding levels, uh, currently available funding levels were identified from those sources. Um, and the, uh, on the expense side, uh, the needs that were identified uh, came through the application of the Federal Transit Administration's Transit Economic Requirements Model, uh, or TERM. This slide summarizes the results, and, and the numbers here are uh, startling, I think, in, in terms of magnitude. By developing and applying this, this um, analytical tool, again, applied using off-the-shelf data, uh, UNEL's work was able to identify a, a fairly significant funding gap between needs and already identified funding. Um, because of the depth of the analysis, because of the believability and credibility of the underlying data, uh, the resulting projections uh, uh, have uh, some significant standing and, and are part of the active uh, discussions currently going on in California looking ahead to future funding. So that was uh, Yanel's presentation. The presentation by Bill Robert of, of uh, SpyPon uh, backed up a step and took in a broader view of all the various techniques uh, that are being applied uh, in the transit industry to project future needs. And this is part of, of uh, TCRP Project E09, um, which is intended to develop an overall framework for uh, transportation organizations a, 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 to uh, identify what their uh, infrastructure rehabilitation replacement needs are uh, and to um, uh, determine a set of priorities um, within uh, constrained funding. Uh, his work um, focused on uh, some of the, the techniques that uh, have been applied in some of the presentations um, summarized uh, this morning by uh, some of our other presenters. Um, the overall um, uh, focal points of, of this research project was uh, to talk about steps to evaluate and prioritize uh, projects, um, what specific uh, measures of effectiveness or performance measures should be used um, in undertaking the analysis, and more importantly, to communicate uh, to decision makers the outcomes of the analysis, um, this information that's been used to establish priorities and to get the funding in place. Part of the issue uh, in doing this type of work is that we're dealing with multiple objectives. Uh, typically, projects are being um, evaluated in the context of uh, multiple strategic objectives of transit agencies that are addressing such factors as safety and security and reliability, uh, response to regulatory constraints and requirements, uh, environmental impacts, vulnerability to climate change. There's a whole a broad range of objectives um, that are being addressed, and, and these techniques um, need to address all of those types of considerations. Zooming in on one particular technique, uh, Glenn Tepke talked about um, the development of the and the eventual application of the data uh, by the Metropolitan Transportation Commission in the San Francisco Bay Area. Uh, the MTC uh, undertook a region-wide effort uh, to develop what they called their Regional Transit Capital Inventory, which uh, addressed the, the more than two dozen transit operators uh, in the region, a very large inventory of 80,000 assets across um, all the modes, and, and at a pretty fine level of detail. With the asset inventory developed in the uh, RTCI, Again, FTA's transit economic requirements model, the same model that was applied by UNL at the state level, was applied uh, at the regional level uh, to develop, uh, one, what the needs uh, were, both on a short-term basis and a long-term basis, and to project ahead what asset condition would be in a variety of uh, funding scenarios. 
all of this was uh, applied in the context of the ongoing efforts that the MTC is undertaking as the MPO uh, in developing the regional transportation plan. And uh, part of that was to evaluate alternative funding um, sources uh, to address those needs. As we look at uh, the all three presentations, um, a couple of um, uh, sort of summary observations uh, come to mind. Um, one is, in the end, uh, we're, for the for the deep level of analysis, two tools are beginning to emerge in the industry as providing the uh, abilities to project ahead. Uh, or, or, or to estimate what the current backlog and state of good repair needs are, to project ahead what future state of good repairs will be or needs will be in the future, and most importantly, to get an understanding of what future asset condition will be if, in fact, we aren't able to fund all of those needs. Uh, in the case of uh, BART, one of the larger operators in the San Francisco Bay Area, uh, BART's looking ahead to apply. The, uh, the new term light product, um, which uh, FTA uh, has available to transit agencies on their public website. Um, and the other uh, technique is the uh, MBTA state of good repair tool, which um, um, earlier speaker discussed in the context of the work that SEPT is currently undertaking. Uh, the tool was applied both at the SFMTA and at, at VTA. Uh, to address these issues, the size of the backlog, what the future needs are, and what happens to asset condition in the future if, in fact, we can't fund at the level of, of the projected needs. Um, and uh, both of those uh, undertakings, both for SFMTA and VTA, were, were done in the context of developing agency-wide financial plans uh, for their proposed new starts projects. And part of the motivation for undertaking um, those in-depth analyses was to respond to uh, concerns by the Federal Transit Administration about the understanding of the agencies, about what their needs would be, and their ability to fund their uh, future asset management needs. The various approaches that were addressed by Yanel and Bill and Glenn uh, highlighted some innovative approaches that are uh, currently being undertaken, uh, both at the state level and at the regional level. Um, and uh, they uh, present those or summarize uh, the, the observations, this is the work that Bill did, uh, in the context of this TCRP project, which establishes uh, broader guidelines for uh, how to evaluate and prioritize uh, future infrastructure renewal and replacement needs. A couple of action items emerged from the presentations and some of the discussion um, uh, during this session. Uh, one in the area of uh, more of a research topic is to begin to look at what is the impact of uh, all this investment that is being um, uh, the need for which is being projected by the various models that are being applied. What happens to reliability? What happens to O&M cost? What happens to ridership uh, when we make these investments? Or maybe turning it around, what happens if we don't make these investments? In many cases, uh, what we're finding, and one of my colleagues uses this term a lot, sometimes we're entering a data-free zone. Nobody really knows for sure, uh, or at least it's not been written down. In fact, I suspect a lot of people know, but it's not uh, a matter of hard data. But there's a lot of knowledgeable people. All the various asset managers and the maintenance departments in the industry uh, really do understand some of these relationships, even if there's not hard data to, to, um, to point to. Uh, in the area of both research and outreach to the industry, um, beginning to address, well, what's the public benefit? of uh, undertaking these investments in, in the context of um, benefit cost analyses and life cycle cost analyses, more, more broad uh, economic impact analyses. This is certainly an area that's worthy of research and probably an area that's worthy of significant discussion, uh, possibly in the, in the context of a webinar like uh, this. Um, even the issue of um, 
defining what do we mean by state of good repair and how does this tie to broader policy goals uh, really is an important issue to address uh, as well. Exactly what we mean by state of good repair in terms of, of uh, reliability or cost effectiveness uh, is an important issue. The Federal Transit Administration has developed this one to five scale that's applied in the term model. Uh, there are other ways to uh, address asset condition across a variety of um, dimensions, and this is certainly an area that's worthy of both outreach to the industry and, and in-depth research. Uh, and the whole issue of, well, what happens on the operating side um, if we do or do not make these capital investments is an area worthy of uh, some significant discussion and research. Uh, at a more practical level, uh, I, I think that uh, one of the uh, issues that came out of the discussion was uh, we need to come up with uh, better ways to communicate the state of good repair needs, uh, both within agencies and between agencies at the uh, local, regional, and state level. What's, what's the expectation on the part of an MPO in terms of the inputs that it's receiving from the transit agencies within its, its area? How is that information then sent on to a State Department of Transportation, for example? And then at a very practical level, uh, with the rollout of uh, the term light model, uh, getting some training uh, out there uh, so that the industry uh, can get a better understanding of how to use that important and emerging tool is also important.